everyone. I'm Patricia Lord, the Executive Director of the Siskiyou County Arts Council, which is the local SLP for Siskiyou County. I know some of you, I don't know all of you, but I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, can I get a show of hands? Who's from Wairika? Who's from Weed? Who's from Dunsmuir? Who's from McLeod? Oh, all right. It's a surprise. Who's from Etna? <laughs> All right, hey, Fort Jones. Nobody's from Fort Jones. All right, we got a gap there. Um, is anyone from Eastern State County? Doris, Butte Valley, Tulu Lake. Okay, we got another gap there. Is anyone from Cap Camp here? McDonald? Nope. All right, so those are the communities that we don't have represented here tonight, but we understand those are farther away and it's a little bit more difficult to get here. Um, so I'm going to introduce the Nevada County Arts Council. They're the ones um, presenting this uh, uh, presentation to you tonight. They're our official partner in the administrative organization for the creative support program for the upstate region. They're going to explain everything I just said to you. So don't worry if it doesn't make any sense. But from the Nevada County Arts Council, we have Eliza, who's the executive director, and Tiana, who I'm sorry, don't know your specific title. Uh, I'm a program coordinator for the California Creative Corps. Thank you. Uh, analyst, a data yeah. analyst. She's the chief nerd. <laughs> chief nerd. <laughs> chief nerd. And so I will hand it over to them. They may do a longer introduction. But if you need anything from me throughout the night, just call that in. But Jess is going to be right here because she's now trapped at my side. <laughs> it's so great to be here. Thank you very much. And I'm actually really glad that to see that there's, there, are, there are those from beyond the city limits tonight. It's very important. And um, tomorrow we're driving through Happy Camp. And I'm hoping to offer a delicious challenge to Patricia. I haven't told her this, but I was thinking about it over the weekend. Perhaps to do a second listening session in that part of the county right before Christmas, snow allowing. Uh, do you think it'll be what do you think the snow will be like before Christmas? Not good. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> Five and eighteen, right? Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Well, we'll go, go and test the roads tomorrow. I, I had no idea that in order to get from here to Crescent City, where we'll be tomorrow, it's actually going to go via Oregon. Yes. But we're going to do it a slightly longer way. We're going to not go straight up, you know, to Central Point. We're going to go across to Happy Camp and then up and then down. I love it. <laughs> anyway, but we, could, we wouldn't be here tonight without Patricia as Executive Director of the Siskiyou County Arts Council. When we applied for the California Creative Corps, which is a new program, um, we we knew we would only be able to do it with the support and consultation of our county arts agencies across the upstate region. So, so Liza, before we start, uh, we do have a Spanish interpreter here with us. I'm so pleased. Yes. So Hi. I think what we would like to do is to find out if there's uh, anyone in the audience that would need um, Spanish translation. And we have her here. She could either be doing it simultaneously or she could sit next to someone that needs that those services. Don't you even think about going away, Holly. We want you. What we're finding sometimes is that the interpreters who join us for these presentations actually become the most marvelous bridges throughout the program. So please remain with us. We're so grateful that you're here. <laughs> um, and we, we have a, a seat for you here or wherever you, you would like to sit. Um, it would be great, Gianna, if everyone who's joining us by Zoom could write where they're from and their affiliation. That's wonderful. Fantastic. Um, in the chat, that would be great. Patricia, before we go further, would you like to get the landing page? Sure. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people who live in Cisco County know much of this already, but you know, we have um, somewhat of a contentious history with the indigenous people of Cisco County. So we want to make sure that we acknowledge that um, the borders of Cisco County are composed of on the lands of the Shasta, the Mordock, 
God, we can't see me for the shows that we're in the military, we can't just bomb the fun and shoot, but the Confederate Indian tribe of Southern Indians, Hawking Hawaii, doing that, we were in the Pacific River, for the Negro, and to our Negro people, since I pronounced that incorrectly. So we want to acknowledge that the work that we're doing today and the work we do in the future will come up there for the hands to pay them a great. Thank you. So I will say that we had previously um, a, a, a very generic map and, and we're learning that came from UC Berkeley. So we thought, well, if it comes from UC Berkeley, it must be the right map, right? But actually it's not quite the right map. And this is the right map. So we're very grateful. Um, it, it gives a lot more contemporary detail Contemporary and historical detail, which is so relevant. Thank you, Susan. Um, I want to thank Jason, city manager um, of Warika, for um, helping us along with Patricia find this beautiful venue. It's so warm and cozy in here. And when I met Tim, who's our cameraman, who's, our, who's recording us, who's filming us tonight, um, he just introduced himself as having been from Weed. But he's also, of course, the city manager of the We have downplayed his role a little. So it's great to have two city managers with us. Um, how many artists are with us this evening? Yay, great, I love it. How many folks representing arts organizations? Great. How many folks representing any local tribes? Tribal, tribal affiliations? Hello. Oh, how great. Thank you so much. What is your name? Yeah. Tina. Tina, thank you very much for joining us. We have sign language interpretation this evening. Does anyone have a need for that? Yeah, whether to somebody on Zoom would need it, That's although right. the transcripts are on. That's so good. We have live transcript on Zoom as well. That's so, great. Yeah. We could also write in the chat that we have available. Well, I am a little hard of hearing, and I'm finding that the volume level is just a little low. So we all have to have our outdoor voices. Outdoor yes, voices. Right. I really we will appreciate it. Teach <laughs> better people this evening. <laughs> Okay, how is it when I speak like that? That's okay. okay. But for you, would it be helpful to pass? No? Tina, it's so great to be here. We actually would love you to join us because your perspective will be a very interesting part of the conversation um, as someone who works with those part of hearing. You need to go next. Good. So, um, social service organizations this evening, anyone representing social service organization or a unit of government? We have, Jason, what are you doing <laughs> sitting over there in the back? You're going to come and join us. Come on. Okay, yeah, okay. You're allowed to get away with it. When you come back, we'll pull you in. <laughs> so, uh, any county folks? We do. Barry, yes, thank you very much for the education. That's great. I'm so glad. Okay, well, I'm just I'm just sort of sizing up the room. <laughs> so um, the California Creative Corps, what is it? It's an economic workforce development recovery pilot program intended to fuel positivity, regain public trust, and inspire health and safety across, across California's diverse populations. I, I find this is, this is drawn from the grant guidelines when we applied for this grant to be the administering organization. And I was interested in that terminology, regain public trust. We've just come through two and a half years. Is it two and a half years? Nearly three years. Nearly three years of a, of a global pandemic. And I, I, from what I understand, the program is in part inspired by a program that <laughs> developed on the heels of the, the Great Depression in the mid-1930s, and which lasted all the way through to the mid 
forties and uh, you know the Second World War. And um, this program was called the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. Is anyone familiar with that? Yes. I know I've had to do a lot of homework about it, and of course we know that it it employed millions of previously unemployed folks across uh, across the states. And underneath the WP umbrella, WPA umbrella, were at least four programs that put artists in different disciplines to work. So I love bearing that in mind as we think about the kinds of projects that might come out of this. But then also bearing in mind, this is a hundred years on. We're in very different circumstances now in many different ways. And let's bear that in mind. So we're not just sort of emulating a program that's a hundred years old, but it's worth bearing in mind you know, the positive impacts and outputs of, of the WPA. Um, it's a new grant program for art. Yes. I'm willing to put all questions to that, but I don't know what more I think. I'm unclear as to who it is that is seeking to regain the trust of the public. Well, it's a state-run program. Yes. The monies come directly from the governor's workforce development and recovery the, monies. The governor or the governor? The, the state, the state government, yes. the state of California. Yes. So these monies are coming from the state of California, and I'll I'll be speaking to that. So how it's going to work this evening, if it's okay with you, is that I'll share some basic information about what the program is, where the money is coming from, what its intended purposes are, the tool that's been given us to evaluate how the monies might be spent and how we might turn the dial. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to turn it over to you. So we're going to get throw a ton of information at you very, very quickly. You're going to think you want to die for so much. No, it's all really nerdy and it's it's kind of the state's fault. It's not us. <laughs> but we love the opportunity. It's absolutely fantastic. We've been working with Katrina, who is actually a scientist by trade, because a lot of this data is very scientific. And 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 Katrina is well, has been able to sort of throw a little bit of an, another light on it. But then we want you to throw a light on it because you know your community. So we'll just trawl through this data for a little bit, make it as fun and tongue in cheek as we possibly can. And then we're going to throw it up to you. Is that okay? Yes. Sounds great. So where among Nevada County Arts Council applied for this big grant because we really wanted to support upstate California. And um, we have the strongest sense that because as a state local partner with the, with the state and our county governments, we have the best possible opportunity of really understanding communities across such a wide region. Um, the program itself um, is responsible for administering $16 million in workforce development funds to put artists to work, to tackle issues that are critical to society. When the grant guidelines came out, the state gave us a little bit of a clue in terms of some of what these issues might be. So we're looking at water, energy, climate mitigation, disaster preparedness and response, think of fire, what other kinds of emergencies, think of health, public health emergencies, um, you know, water and energy conservation, um, civic engagement, including election, election, election participation, so we've been looking at a tool that, that tells us, you know, what's, what's um, election participation got to do with anything? We've been looking at these things. We've drawn, these words come from the grant guidelines that we applied for. Social justice and community engagement and public health awareness. So this is what the map of California looks like if you see it through the eyes of California Arts Council, the state agency for the arts. This is how it's divided up California, um, where the yellow bit at the top, 19 counties, you can see that the other administering organizations, there are, there are nine sections of, of, the, of the state, ours is the largest. So we've got a lot of ground to cover and a lot of administration to do. And of course, we know that there are many ways of looking at California. The map on the left shows a sort of economic perspective. These are the regions according to the California Economic Resiliency Fund, which is another large pot of money that's come from the state, which is designed to fuel 
um, you know, workforce development and recovery and um, business investment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in this particular map, you can see that the upstate region is divided into two regions, um, uh, actually three, um, Sacramento, the Redwood Coast, the North State is what we would call upstate according to the California Creative Corps. The map at the top is, is how UC Berkeley defines the historical arts, the sort of more the languages, uh, the tribal language um, makeup of, of our state. The map on the, guess, do you know what the, the map on the bottom is? The red, yellow, and orange, and red, and green maps. What do you think that is? Yes, 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 yes. So it's watersheds. Oh, you can say yes, it <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, you're so clever. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. So, for example, when Katrina thinks about the upstate, she thinks about the relationship of peoples to water and the importance of that when we consider so many of these issues that are critical to us. So it's basically showing when you're, when you're trying to discern what hydrologic means, but basically it's if a drop of water fell in the area that you're seeing, where would it eventually flow out? So everything in the green area, eventually that water will flow out directly along the coastal watersheds of the ocean. Anything in the yellow areas of our state will actually eventually come into the Sacramento River to flow out through Golden Gate. And in the red area, that actually flows into the Great Basin. So the, the Mount Shasta weed area would be right on that border. You're on the cusp of two that's watersheds. That's yeah, right. you were part of both watersheds, exactly. What we're doing, what you're beginning to realize is that we're feeding you clues about what you might consider. Picture, picture yourselves in its early spring, and Nevada County Arts Council, through the Upstate California Creative Corps, has opened up the possibility of you to apply funding as artists, arts organizations, or as you know, units of government in collaboration with artists or arts organizations. You're thinking, what do I create a project around? So this evening, what you're hearing from us are just little clues about what you, for the most part, probably already know about yourselves, your watersheds, how your regions are divided according to the state in terms of you know, economic regions. And then, of course, we, when we're designing our listening tour, we're looking at you know roads and the relationship of roads and the rivers and how we how we how community how how communities communicate through transport. So yes, when we're looking at the upstate region, we're looking at three hundred and seventy four census tracts, nineteen counties, thirty one percent of California's geography, but only four point two of its population. Um, we're looking at three um, watersheds. We're looking at incredible precipitation averages, um, you know, ranging from four inches a year in Modoc to 95 in parts of Del Norte. So we're looking at sea level to 14,000 feet in Mount Shasta. And we're looking at a range of, 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 of economic, including agriculture, timber, ocean fisheries, mining, tourism, and energy. You know all these things. I just wanted to explain um, in a little bit more detail, but only very briefly. Every county in California, there are 58 counties, and 54 of them have county arts councils or county arts agencies. Each one of them connects into, we have to seek a resolution each year from our county board of supervisors that names us eligible to apply to be what's called a state local partner with the California Arts Council. That makes us highly accountable. We're accountable on the one hand to the state and on the other to our county board of supervisors. So each year we go before our board of supervisors, we deliver a, an annual report, and then we write an exhaustive application to the California Arts Council to receive a tiny amount of funding for which we are incredibly grateful, which pays portions <laughs> of our salaries or other things which um, the your state local department, that's Patricia, Fields are important for your community. So in each in each county, possibly the most accountable arts agency will be your state local partner, your county arts council. And I say this um, with with kind of weight because that accountability drives us. We communicate monthly 
Um, we all get together once a month across the state and we benchmark together best practices. We talk about what we're seeing in terms of trends and community needs and our diverse populations for this well. So we're very, very connected. And we're very, very connected. So we're going to be introducing today, this is the nerdy, terrifying bit. We're going to be introducing today a new tool that the state has given us as a way to evaluate our success. When we give out these funds to you, the state is going to be saying, how do we how do we know that the projects that you propose are successful? We're going to be measuring it against um, this new tool, tool called the Healthy Places Index. We ask you, um, we ask you to use sort of um, scale and relativity. This is a map that we've been given, and we're going to find creative ways. Um, you know, to work with them as best we can, knowing that lived experience, your lived experience of your communities may look really, really different. So we ask you to challenge us on the data that you see. Some of it will make sense. Some of it just won't feel real. It won't feel true. It won't feel heartfelt. So you tell us what your healthy community looks like. Do you want to speak to this slide? Sure, yeah. China? Um. As we come into each area, you know, the 19 counties and fight that rage you saw, we of course like to understand the basics, but just again, you know, we might miss things. So have that in your awareness here. But in looking at it in terms of one of the things, the Siskiyou County in terms of the upstate region of the 19 um, counties is the largest county within the upstate region. Um, it also has the highest elevation within the upstate region. So I just always like those extra, you know, knowing those great little claims of the, um, the piece as a 12.6% of upstate geography. I listed the different primary waterways um, as well as the public lands. We particularly are curious about the public land base because that has an impact on county tax basis as well. It also a sense of place. So just understanding as we come in. College and universities looking at opportunities for education helps us understand some of the metrics we see for bachelor's education, the ability to pursue it. We learned when we were in Modoc, for instance, Modoc County. I mean, I, I, anyone who wants to go to college, they only leave where they grew up, you know, and that's that's an important factor. Um, also looking at tribal lands and then the county resource groups. Again, there might be some missing here, but just understanding to know who. Who might make sense to have here at the table to help us understand the data that we see from your points in the So the, the state has given us the upstate region a total of close to $3.4 million to go directly to pay artists to produce projects that create create awareness around some of the issues that you know are important in Sisley. And then trying to marry those again with the tool that we're just about to present to you. Um, and the reason that we put all these very, very obvious known facts on paper, so to speak, within a presentation is that we're going to share this with you. We're also creating um, a, a, a Spanish translation as well. We'll be sharing these with um, you and with Patricia. We'll each have them on our website. We're going to show you the website that, we're, that we created and it will get better as the days go by. It's pretty rudimentary at the moment. But you'll you'll be in receipt of this. And again, all these are just clues to help you brainstorm among yourselves as the months go by before the guidelines are created. You know, it'll perhaps you'll be able to sort of have meetings of your own beyond this. Or perhaps what you see here tonight will you'll think, oh yes, I should connect with this resource group, or this resource group is missing, and we'll let Patricia know, or Patricia will let us know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We'll try to improve it before we send it back to you. Here's a here's a, a map of, of the history of fire in California, and, and this bit is um, justice. Do you want to speak to this, Katrina? Sure. Other than a change formatting, by sort of that sort of intriguing that way, this is good. Um, but um, this is looking over time at fire in the last century, and the green um, zones are areas of fire early in the earlier part of the century, and the large the pinker colors are ones that are more recent time. 
So it looks at the pattern of fire in the area and something that definitely stands out, something you're quite familiar with, of course, um, fires are getting bigger, more intense, much more acreage covered. So this matters because when we're looking at an area, we also want to understand as we look at projects, we look at what we're going to define as, as a healthy community. We have to think about, well, what is that over time too? What are we looking at in the next 10 years, 50 years with changing climate with different with different fire picture? It was quite intriguing for us when we went through um, Greenville in Plumas County to learn that they actually took the opportunity, you know, here this devastating thing, the entire town burned down. They changed where the downtown district is, where the business areas are, where the residences are, you know, as they're coming back in to occupy. Um, not to say that they haven't we have to do it that way. That's an extreme version, but it's important for us to see where we think we're heading, especially in terms of fire, um, especially in terms of forest density. You know what projects you'll learn some more about potential projects to do with fire. And one of the reasons that we were, as an agency, very inspired to apply to be the administering organization for this sum of money for the entire upstate region was that we've just come off of a three or four year project um, that mapped um, an arts project that mapped the 13,000 year history of forest management from the receding of the last ice age and the, the, the way that our indigenous peoples, our first peoples cared for, for the forests. And then, and then we looked at what we actually created a sort of three dimensional installation of public art, the largest public art installation the region has experienced, that so that people could walk through the forest over a 13,000 year timeline and experience the way the forests were firsthand. So this is a marvelous way that the arts can be put to use to share the sort of devastating truth, if you like, in order to come up with very positive possible solutions. Um, so here's a, another map looking at fire history, again, um, with the different indices for periods of time closer in specific to Siskiyou County. Obviously, we know people so much more well. <laughs> Trisha, I hope you don't mind me calling upon you. Um, about a week or so ago, Patricia and I had a conversation that touched me deeply about your most recent fires. And, um, and, and so here we are showing you a map, but Patricia was able to speak to the actual real devastation to the lives of some of your community members and how it has meant that they have had to find homes of elsewhere. Yes, yeah, so let's all just get on my little soapbox. I'll stand up because otherwise you'd never know where the sound's coming from. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we all know that the mill fire destroyed a large portion of um, Lincoln Heights, which is, um, I, I don't know, quote me on this, I think it's one of the oldest still standing black communities in the state of California, and it definitely is within Siskiyou County. This is an unbelievable cultural asset for the county of Siskiyou, and I understand that there's already been pledges of certain amounts of money to um, help with rebuilding that community. My personal um, perspective on it is we need to make sure that whatever rebuilding happens ensures that um, either the original Black community or a continuous Black community remains um, in that space. Otherwise, it does not feel like it is really in, uh, rebuilding to me. It feels like it's um, essentially gentrification, that one community was um, by chance removed and then was replaced with another. So that's my little soapbox statement to everyone here. I hope you help me um, uh, put that uh, perspective out into the community that that needs to remain a continuously Black community in the city. Um, I think if you uh, look at the statistics for Black population in Siskiyou County, it's under 2% for the county as a whole. It jumps to, it depends on where you get your information, between 6 and 12% for the city of Siskiyou County. So it's, it's in, incredibly important to our history um, in Siskiyou County. And the cultural diversity and makeup of the county, too. And, and this is, this is I, I'm so glad you rose to the challenge because I, 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 I wasn't sure sort of how personal the information was that Patricia shared with me. And, and, and this is an example of how we can come in with all the data in the world, you already know this stuff. We're putting it on paper as a, as a way to jog your memory later. 
but add to it your own local knowledge and it becomes real it becomes okay guys let's create a project around this although and we'll talk to this a little bit later so although we could give and will be giving funds to projects that are exemplary or have the potential to be exemplary you know within county lines we'll also be challenging artists to create collaborations with each other and with organizations that go beyond the county lines because of course fire knows no county lines water watersheds tribes have no county lines so all these things are clues to perhaps presenting more uh, projects that carry um, you know greater innovation deeper collaborations um, and must be funded in a slightly different way perhaps more ambitiously so be thinking love it and here, of course, is the mighty Klamath River. Do you want to speak to this? <laughs> Patricia, I mean, yeah. I don't know why I should call me a dad in there. And I think I'm just like a lover of, your, of the landscape. And again, this you know, is poetry for Katrina. Oh, yeah. And, and I've known the Klamath for a long time but because I've been a whitewater kayaker since my like, early 20s. So, um, so, certainly know it well that way. But it's also this huge artery that connects so many communities beyond the California border, multiple counties. So again, just what Eliza was saying, you know, although we, we are coming to each county, you know, in, the, in many ways also see it, we're coming to speak to each watershed. We did a map for our watershed where we live for Nevada County because it's tied in across four different counties. And there's so much, so much love of the Yuba River and there's so much potential. And there's people down at the mouth of the Yuba where it eventually goes out the Golden Gate that have some conditions where they have a very different relationship with the river and the kids don't even ever get to the upper watershed. So what are some of the opportunities in a way of sense of place? What, what about the Klamath River helps define your place as a healthy place? What are your own sense of metrics of what determines healthy, healthy living? In the part of the Yuba River where we live, we know it for the swimming pools it offers, you know, during the summer, it's absolutely gorgeous. If you follow the river down where it meets the Feather River, it's devastating. There are whole sort of counterculture cities of homeless people. It's a completely devastating experience. So you can see how one artery, one river system will offer opportunities for projects to serve vulnerable communities in completely different ways. So. And here is the makeup, according to the Healthy Places Index, using the census, obviously, we know that there are issues perhaps with the last, with all, well, with all censuses, um, but particularly with the 2020 census, which this grew from. Um, this is the overall um, system county um, race and ethnicity composition. But as we're going to show you, you can actually determine tract by tract. How many in Cisco altogether? How many tracts were there in Cisco? We'll Yes, we'll look at it in a minute. Thank you. I was going to say, we'll look at it in a minute um, and, um, and see. You, you, there will be a breakdown per uh, tract. See. Yeah. And so this is the Healthy Places Index. It might be nice to share the link to that. Um, in the chat so that folks can follow along. It's healthyplacesindex.org. Um, so what do you think, if you were to hazard a guess, if you look at that map of California right here, there are four colors that you see, dark blue, light blue, dark green, light green. Which communities do you think the dark green, which, which is more healthy and which is less healthy according to the color coding on this map would be? If we're talking about air, maybe it's not so healthy in those Los Angeles and San Francisco areas. If you're talking about uh, monetary, just general, general health. I love it. Well, that's what you should feel that you live in those areas, don't you? Right. That's, that's what you should do. Good pride of place. I agree. Well, definitely going to get you more money because they're actually. The least healthy communities are the dark blue areas, according to the Healthy Places Index. And there's so many exceptions to this. Um, and then the dark green areas represent um, the green areas in general are more healthy 
and it's because you know access to resources, urban areas, infrastructure, traditional resources. So again, it's according to this map, but there are many different. Um, there are many, uh, you know, exceptions, as we'll find out. Um, this is the upstate region in particular. Um, Trina, would you like to speak to why the default position of the Healthy Places Index lands on tracts rather than cities or congressional or legislative districts or counties, for example? Yeah, well, they, um, they wanted to use a continuous piece of, of land that doesn't want, the boundaries won't change. Um, in many cases, the boundaries of census tracts actually follow geographic boundaries, rivers, watersheds. Um, roads, you know, the roads often follow rivers, as we know. Um, so it won't change over time. The way a census tract will change is the population increases quite a bit. It might be split in two or they might consolidate, but it allows over a long period of time to make comparisons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does the Healthy Places Index use as markers for health? How does it, what are the factors that go into it? So this is what the Healthy Places Index is measuring. It's, me it's measuring economic factors, education, social, transportation, neighborhood, housing, clean environment, and healthcare access. We know there are so many more than that. This is what the Healthy Places Index is measuring. We provided this slide again, this is a, a clue, this is Cisco overall, and those policy action areas, those indices on the left hand side, they pop up every time you click. We're going to do a live demonstration in a minute. But every time you click on a track, those policy action um, areas pop up and tell you specifically about the, that track. So it's fascinating. So you can burrow down and see very precisely where you live and what's affecting the overall health outcomes according to this map. So when looking at that one, this is just basically a nutshell of looking at Siskiyou County, looking at the data and how it lands in terms of um, in terms of comparing conditions. They compare. If you're looking at a county, you're comparing to other counties in California. If you're looking at a tract, and again, we'll show you this in a second, then it'll compare to other tracts. But what really stood out to me um, for Siskiyou County was actually so. I this is my cheat sheet where I can see how many. Tracks we had totals like 14 total here. Okay, so there are five dark blue tracks, five light blue, one light green, and there are three tracks that are excluded. Let me tell you a little bit about tracks that are excluded. They're usually excluded because the population is less than 1,500 people, which doesn't mean they should be excluded from our thinking about them. It's just they can't really draw conclusions as well. Also, they can be excluded if there's a high density, high population of dormitory style living, such as um, what you see with prisons in communities and some other dormitories like that. Um, but what stood out here at Siskiyou was employment levels was zero to 25 percentile for all of the Siskiyou tracks. So that just has a question of, you know, what is exactly how people are employed? Employment is determined as um, people age 25 to 64 that are working a job. So it's not post retirement that's separated out. So just understanding, and as Eliza likes to always ask that question, is, and what can artists do? You know, what can artists do about that? So asking the question, what, what's something that could get to a friend? Um, I compare often looking at the per capita income, the lowest is in track two over by Doris, and the highest is uh, track 10 near Mount Shasta City. So understanding some of the range, again, because when you're looking at the county averages, it's then taking that range and swatching it to give you a number. So it's not always as informative as looking specifically at the tracks or the areas that you're most, or the, if you have a topic you're most interested in. So, so again, later you can go to um, you can go to this map yourselves and you can think, oh, we want to focus on a project that just looks at this track. Can you go back one last one? I just yes, want to sure. add because one of the things that also stood out is there was track track one over in Lava Beds that's technically excluded because the population is less than 1,500. It had a 62.7% Latin Hispanic population before it. So that was, that was something I read. So next, just, just because it's excluded doesn't mean that you need to exclude it. Exclude it. If you think that that's enough of a clue to, for you to create an incredible project around to serve that Latino population, you do it and you say why. 
and we will listen. <laughs> so um, let's go into, yes, it, uh, you've circled Cisview, which is great, because this shows you what's going on. And this shows those excluded zones that look like sparky pajamas. And then the pale blue, which is, you, it, it, it appears on the surface that you have no very healthy areas, according to this index. But that's actually not true. We're going to dive in and have a look. So this is what the Healthy Places Index looks like when you when you go onto it, and then you can click on that little thing that says "Visit the HPI map." Oh, and I'm not connected to the internet, so let's connect me. City of Eureka, what's the password? Um, it's Yreka Community Center, but their capital for YCC. Do you just do that? Yeah. I'm so sorry. Take a note of this. So, actually, how many of you just kind of get at the health of the community? How many of you have a doctor, whether it's your primary care doctor or like an optometrist, dentist that you go see regularly that is out of county, that you have to drive somewhere? How many people? Yeah, that's a lot. Do you think people who live in San Francisco have to leave the city of San Francisco to go see their doctors? No, they do not. They can see multiple doctors in that city. So that's one of the things that the Healthy Places Index is um, attempting to demonstrate in a number is that um, you have lower access to health care, health providers on a regular basis because driving 90 miles to Reading is prohibited. That's brilliant. We have a raised hand here from Erica. What's that? We have a raised hand from Erica. Erica, please. Erica, you um you can take yourself off mute um and speak to us. And just so you know, we do have a a device here that's broadcasting our meeting, so everyone will be able to hear you. Okay, she said, um, no, I just meant, oh, sorry. No, I just meant I also have that problem. So oh, she was just yeah. raising her hand because of that. Okay, her primary care provider is out of town. I know, exactly. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, Katrina, do you want to put something out? Tell me where to go. Yeah, I, think, I thought we'd first jump into Tract 5 because Tract 5 is the one that's up here by having you. It has the lowest Cisco, what's overall score, which the, what you'll see is that that's a conglomeration of all the scores and indices. Here. So notice when I clicked on that track, um, and I did as I was told, mm -hmm. on the left-hand side, it popped up with what the community conditions are. Those are the, the conditions that are measured by these things called policy action areas. So, yeah, no, it's perfect. So this one's at the 16.2 percentile. And again, as a reminder, that just means that, so as far as comparing to other tracks, this tract has healthier community conditions than 16.2 percent of other California tracks. You can reverse it the other way. In other way. words, there aren't very many other tracks that are as unhealthy as this one. Because you put a positive spin on it, but we're trying to give you clues well, about what, the what, we, what yeah. we could possibly <laughs> find. So this is a dark blue area. It means there's a little bit of work to be done in this area. Let's look for the clues and how can artists rally around. And another thing, it compares it to the county average and it's significantly lower than the county average. So again, that's, that's informative. In some places, we come across a lot of dark blue tracks and it's really similar to the county average overall too. So that might have a larger systemic. This might have a more regional look. So when each of these we can open on up. So if Eliza wants to open up the economic one with that tab, we can specifically see, and we see that it's two of the factors to do with economics are in the dark blue. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can go further into employment, if you like, you click on that little arrow there and it goes, and it tells you, you know, what does this indicator mean? Um, and how does, how does it compare with this, the rest of the county and the rest of the state? Every household should be able to afford the necessities of a healthy life, medical care, healthy food, quality housing, education, and other basics. Those are all keys to the kinds of projects that you create for that area. Healthy food, medical care, quality housing, education, and other basics. Stable employment allows people to afford the goods and services that are necessary for good health. Research indicates that economic opportunity 
especially having a job, is one of the most powerful predictors of good health, and that impacts on health are especially pronounced for people in or near poverty. So all the clues to an application of funding as an artist or collaborative um, are there for you. I have a question. Yeah. Why is all, why is everything, why does everything stop at 64? I feel disenfranchised. I'm a 66 year old artist and I am not being, my statistics are not included in any of this. Mm -hmm. um, we have a huge population of retired people here in this county and they, they may not have a job, they may not need what they need, they have other needs. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not, it's it's not being counted. We're not being counted. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, why but, does it stop at 64? Why right? does it not stop at 64? And that's where employment, um, employment, it's not, it's counted for other, uh, well, other employment, no, but I, all sorts of things, um, access to, to um, resources. Uh, we have, we have a lot of mature artists in this county and the statistics don't support us. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing to say that you, as a 66-year-old artist, cannot apply for funding and tackle some of these issues. Mm -hmm. So I challenge you to do that. I mean, we have the same in our community. That we have a very, you know, a, a, it's, it's a, a beautiful, strong, and aging community with a lot of artists who are your age and older. Um, the talent in this county over 64 is, is, is amazing. And, and, you know, we can't help but feel a little disenfranchised from, from all the statistics stuff in 64. Like, there's no life after that. And, you know, what I'm looking at is actually trying to jumpstart a new phase of my of my creative career mm -hmm. and um, wondering how this even applies to me. Mm -hmm. But you said only the, the unemployment is up to 64, yes. right? All the, uh, we're included in everything else. It's just unemployment. It's, yeah. it's just employment. None of these other indices are, are you know, reserved for that particular age bracket. Um, the only other ones are like education mm -hmm. is reserved for an age for pursuing bachelor's education. I do want to flag this tract had relatively, you know, much higher education scores than we've seen in a lot of other areas in California. So building well, upon just, that. Yeah, I question it because as far as, as employment goes, it's a whole different situation with mature people. We're not necessarily need to be employed in mm -hmm. support. That's true in other ways. And you will find gaps. You will find questionable areas where you where you will think, well, what are they counting? And then I'm, and I, 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 today I called a couple of the other executive directors of other administering organizations in other regions just to do some benchmarking because these questions are coming up at every listening session we have. And they, they lack local knowledge. It lacks local knowledge in terms of understanding what the real situation is and what the, the real risks and opportunities are. And that's where we turn to them to. We say, you know this, so you tell us, and you build a case for support with what you know. We will be encouraging intergenerational learning and intergenerational projects. And that doesn't have to be necessarily connected with formal education. It could be. I mean, I'm thinking of a marvelous um, project that my daughter, who's now 18, she's uh, 18, yes. And she, she left high school last year fabulous project um, connecting um, culture parents and, and um, older members of the community um, were, were given um, a number of kids um, to mentor. And it was one of the projects I thought we got to find that, you know, a bit of a stretch. She absolutely loved having her mentor to go to with some sort of marvelous intergenerational learning that went on through the arts. So I, I strongly, like the, the worst thing you can possibly do is say this isn't for me. You've just got to make it for you because you have the talent and you have the experience. So you just shout about it. 
I just, I, there, to me, there seems a real disconnect. Mm -hmm. And so, that's, that's why I'm just, I'm just I don't know. I love it. I love that you have, and now you have to make a connection. I can kind of follow <laughs> up on that too, but, you know, yeah, I have the same way to say what I read it, but this is the state of California data, and this is how they control the first string of how they're going to weed out what's going to get the funding. So, as a prime example, here in the city of Wide Ridge, that it's pretty largely broadcast with the schools. And that grant would not be applied to reading schools because that is considered too affluent for the federal government, right over here on that street, which really makes that. So it's just they have this data and we have to fit within this data and get this funny. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just gonna before we leave that particular track, and this is really just an example. You can click later, you know, you can click on on this yourself. Katrina, you wanted to sort of draw attention to this. For this well, particular tract. Well, this tract has the highest Native American population for seven. So I just didn't want to skip over and leave it before we left because it's something that super I mean it's quite important for us to look at, you know. And we there was a really, really amazing discussion that happened in Butte County where we looked at some of the um it's not, and it's not just reparations I'm speaking to, it's the wisdom, it's the the path as we go forward, the how will we live in the direction. Um, with our landscape so it just seemed like a lot of opportunity here so in other words i think katrina you're saying is there the question is is there a correlation between the high percentage of, of, of tribal peoples in this tract and the fact that it's showing to be a relatively unhealthy community what can we do to help that? Or, or actually i actually was even saying um this is a high percentage of native, native american population with probably a lot of wisdom and what is it that Love we can it. tap upon? Yep. Uh, that's not the word that I meant in that form, but what can we utilize to bring forth wisdom as we go forward? So, do you know too that it was devastated by fire in 2020? Uh, Labor Day fire started in Epic Camp, went over actually the way you're going to go over the Mount Dew O'Brien's. It was a uh, horrendous time, and many people lost their homes. So there's a lot of issues. There's a serious lack of housing throughout the county. Yeah. Um, in particular, there's a serious lack of housing. Um, another point I just want to throw out. So if you look at the statistics, um, Siskiyou County as a whole, I think you had it cited at 3%. I think it's actually a little higher, 5 to 6% um, Native American population. That seems really low when you just look at it by itself, but I want to note that's higher than state and federal averages for communities for native um, populations. So we do have a relatively large native population in this county. Um, and I want to note again, Happy Camp is where the, um, the center is, and there are a lot of groups that live in Happy Camp. So um, that accounts for the jump um, to uh, the higher population percent. We're hoping it's not going to snow the week before Christmas. So I'm hoping to persuade, persuade Patricia to let us come back and do a little listening session in Happy Cup. So um, we'll pray not for snow. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, we are praying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, just those two days. Yeah. <laughs> just, a, just a quick look at Eureka. It's, it's, why you are you uh, okay? You're going to read You got it, but let me talk in English. Me so sorry. So if you look at at, at where you can, you can you can see it's an incredible right old mix, isn't it? Are we near? We're quite near where you have high school right now. Yes. Yes. It's just over the there, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's where we are. And then right across the highway, look at this tract of. Of dark blue, you would know more than we do what is making that up. Do you know what I mean? So, um, and even within, even within the, the pale green, there's something that's preventing it from become becoming, you know, um, dark green. Dark green. Yeah. Are you on? Are you on that one right now? Will you be on the dark green? You might be on the green one. The other I'm one. I'm on the green one on purpose, just to show. If you're if you're dead set on a proposing a project for a pale green area. 
know that you can find data in here that's stopping it from becoming the ultimate healthy community. So, for example, here it's um, the one Dream. thing pulling it down is is um, yeah transportation. transportation, but also economic employment again. So you might have a small project where you think really bring awareness to that. What might that look like? So just to share that. Katrina, were you wanting to I want you to just do that one and then I want you to look at education because we just flagged the high school within this track. Mm -hmm. Okay. And go ahead and flag down and open up education. Okay. I was very perplexed by the high school enrollment. It's quite low, 8.8 percent file. So for that track. So mm -hmm. again, understanding <clears throat> We don't we don't know what, what's happening there and again that question of you know what might be done what i and what could be something maybe a project between the two tracks right i wonder how that's measured you know we have uh, there's a private christian school there's also uh community uh, day schools there's i i wonder how they measure it if they just take the actual high school enrollment instead of the branches of other uh, parts of the high school. Yeah. No, I think they take the full media. It's all captured. Yes. I, mean, either, I, I, I too have questions like that. Are they counting those who have been homeschooled? Yes, right. they are. Um, um, yeah, I know. I have, you're right. To, think um, to question everything. It's important to question everything. <laughs> so I kind of feel like now that you've had a little bit of a look at this, and I'm just going to zoom out again just enough so that you can have one last look at. Uh, Cisco as a whole, with all its, you know, different areas. Uh, but it's so huge, Cisco, isn't it? It's <laughs> not just county, it's the largest state. It's, it's largest in the upstate region. Yes. It's the fifth largest in all of um, California. It's extremely large. It's really saying something. And that in itself is both a beautiful thing, <laughs> but it's also, you know, there are, there are challenges there. And those challenges, how can they be turned into opportunities when applying for funding as artists? So um, with that, I'm just going to, unless you want me to list any other areas, I'm so keen to start sort of brainstorming. Yeah. With you. No, I just flag a few, but when you, you're going to have the links for this, so you can go there and then. The, Absolutely. The one on the far right near Doris. <laughs> look at it, especially if you have an interest in that area of working, collaborating. I have a question about Happy County and your know, location. Uh, it's the, I think it's called the Klamath uh, River Arts Affiliation. Are they still in business there with the, the painters? And... Yes. Yes. With, um, Alan, yeah. Yes. Um, I believe they're still there. I recently put out an inquiry to see if they were doing anything. So, anyone, I told this story to a couple of people last time I was in Happy Camp. It was with Mark Oliver, and it was a comical disaster. Oh. But um, <laughs> Alan and everyone at the Siski Climate Arts Center was fantastic. Yeah. Um, and so if you do go out that way, please let me know, and I will make some introductions to you. I, I don't know that they've done anything recently, but I hope that they are not. Um, well, I, I'm asking to make sure that you go visit Alan. Yeah, yeah. in there. Um, I'll tell you the comedy of errors that it was sure. privately. <laughs> But yeah, I love that. Really yeah. great. So the idea is that we that we we inspire this small group of folks and those that are on the Zoom that you go forth and inspire other people and perhaps start thinking of collaborations. We'll be maintaining an ever closer connection with Patricia and with the Arts Council um, as we develop the guidelines, having listened to you. Um, there are so many things we need to take into account here. Um, you know, what are the factors that might determine how much a county or region might be apportioned? So if you look at 3.38 million, which is the amount we have to give out across 19 counties, we did by the five county, it'd be by 170, 180,000 a county. But wouldn't it be more interesting to look at it in relation to, and certainly the state wishes us to do this. Obviously, we want monies to go to artists who are proposing projects, they're going to somehow affect positive change and shine a light on some of the most critical issues to your communities, whether they're regional issues or very, very localized issues, you will know best and you will form the right partnerships. Um, do we, it's somehow incredibly small, it's it's really small I know. <laughs> 
So um, do we do we look at it? Do we determine how much um, you know based upon the county population or its size? Um, it's the degree to which um, tribal and ethnic considerations should should be taken into account. Um, the overall proposal strength will be a very important factor. So really make your case. Um, and the likely longevity or sustainability of a project beyond this pilot phase. So remember, this is the first project, workforce development project of its kind, um, a statewide project within America since the WPA. So all eyes are upon us. Let's think about our products in relation to whether they can possibly become you know, gold standard projects that be copied by other communities in other places in California or even across the nation. So be thinking about that. And then, um, yes, options for or existence of cross county collaboration and mentoring. We've talked about that already. We're not just driven by what's happening in Cisco, maybe something very important to um, turn the dial on the relative health of communities in Cisco, but only if you work better with communities that are just outside and you share something very specific. Maybe it's watershed, maybe it's something else. Um, and then uh, there, just bear in mind there are conditions that this map has afforded. You mentioned the fire in Happy Camp that happened possibly after the 2020 census. You know what I mean? So you know stuff that this map doesn't know. And so make sure we know that when you propose something. But, and then what size grants should we offer? And this is where I'm going to turn it over to you. Like, should we be offering, what, at what point does a grant become meaningful? Is it $1,000 for one artist? Is it $5,000? What's the, what's the very, the, you know, what's the very minimal amount we can give to a group of folks working together on a beautiful mural or on a new guide that literary artists can write for Sicily County? Um, is, are there discretionary or higher impact grants? And what do we, what do we, what's the amount that we should give across county and regional side for us? So I just, at this stage, I kind of want to turn it over to you um, to, you know, to talk about this. And just to remember, as Patricia said in the beginning, who's not here right now? We don't have any tribal representatives in the room. We don't, and uh, we have so very few BIPOC um, communities represented here. Um, let's bear that in mind looking forward. Um, grant guidelines will come out in February, February or March. Um, we have to have presented our grant guidelines for consideration by California Arts Council in early January. So we have a lot of work to do, talking among ourselves until that time. We have created a website, upstatecreative.org. It has a Facebook page. Please like or follow whatever you're meant to do with Facebook. Um, like tonight, go on to Upstate, find Upstate California Creative Core on Facebook, like it. We're going to be taking a picture tonight of all of us together. And um, we'll be taking some pictures as we go um, through Happy Cat tomorrow and everything we see. And we'll make a post for Cisco, and we'd love it if you would share it um, among your own context and invite others to like or whatever you do with like a page. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just clearly not a social media person, but we do have people working on social media, so it's important. And then there's a link to the, the Healthy Places Index map, and most importantly, keep in touch with your state local partner. So talk to us, how big should the grants be? Let's start there. What do you reckon? What would be meaningful to you as artists? Well, in this day and age, thousand dollars is nothing. It just it disappears. Um, I think a minimum of five thousand dollars is is far more effective in supporting any whatever project is. I have to say something. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I was I was a consultant. I was asking to stand up or speak up. Just to speak so that, yes. yeah. Can you all hear me? Because you are being, we're being recorded tonight. Yes, and we're good. going to be taking, and we're going to be taking the best of what we hear from you and give it back to you to remind yeah. you. 
And, and um, we also want the rest of upstate California to benefit from what you have to say. Okay. So we'll be completing both the Siskiyou specific video and an upstate. <laughs> okay, go for it. Okay, with your so, <laughs> as I told you, I, I used to work for the Arts Council for third of about 10 years, and I was a consultant with the Siskiyou Arts Council as they went down the drain. Uh, so my mind has gone. Um, I keep thinking of ideas. Everywhere I go, I think this needs that. That needs this. The other hard part of my mind is saying, "No, I'm not doing. It. I'm not doing it. I'm done." So, um, who do I talk to? Because I don't necessarily want to get involved with these plans, which are very worthy and very needed. Mm -hmm. But I do have some ideas that probably would be useful. So, without without getting myself dragged into it, how can I help? Does that make sense? Do I seem selling? Yeah, okay. You have to collaborate with people. No, no, you I don't to... want to. No, no. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to. No. I'm traveling too much. I'm, I'm talking about, I, I do want to introduce my wife because oh. she is a, a legacy tier California Arts Council fellow. <gasps> Oh, congratulations. Thank That's you. Amazing. For 2021. That was so hard to get. I yes. honestly, I sort of deeply resent it as well. It's a lot. In my lifetime of working, I've done many of my own homegrown community projects. Mm -hmm. And and I think that did help um, in receiving um, the award. Yeah. Um, I'm fascinated by people and had created projects where I would introduce an artist to people. That's that's kind of the, where the very basic, um, Picasso said it's important for the artist, well, not only do you need to know your role as an artist in your society, but you need to have and create enthusiasm. And that was, Picasso said, it's important that the artist create enthusiasm. And, and arts would do that. I understand what a little bit about what you're saying. I, I, I'm more interested in enthusiasm and mental health issues and access to joy as, a, as always been one of my themes as a working artist and many people's things here, I'm sure, because art brings joy and we have a natural intelligence that we can fire up in people. And that's the kind of things that are interesting to me. What I worry about when I look at things like this is am I being asked as an older artist who's worked 50 years to take my art and push it into, it's gotta be about fires or floods. You see, that kind of freaks me out. Uh, that part I don't understand quite as much. So am I being asked to create like in the WPA, I've seen works of great beauty. And are we being, can we keep the beauty part? Or it, there's, there's the directions I'm not, not understanding. She's created beautiful, you say beautiful works. Yeah. How do we fit that into, um, I don't, I'm shook up. Maybe I. Yes, because <laughs> I don't get it. So here's my perspective on this program and how it fits with this account. Um, first off, it's important to understand that there is no specific um, criteria in this grant program that new works of art be created. That is not an outcome that is explicitly stated. What this is, is about getting artists who are hardest hit by the pandemic back to work. It's about putting money in your pocket, and it's about putting money in your pocket related to these issues, because these are the issues the state has identified as this is where we need work and this is where we are yeah. short on labor. So guess what? We're gonna pay you to do it. And the reason we're paying you to do it is because you think about things in an interesting and new way and you need it. Um, my personal, personal perspective on this, and I have specific examples that I won't necessarily get into all of them tonight is, um, I would like to see this money. This is a large chunk of money for Cisco County, to be honest. I don't know if we're gonna get this again. It's really available. Um, rather than dole it out in small amounts to individuals, I would um, like to propose the idea that we think about one project that we can use, one or two projects that we can use this money as seed money for, and that those projects explicitly be designed so that they um, are generous, so that they keep going after the grant period, so that we have them after this money and bonds, we still have that thing. 
we still have employment for artists. We still have the groups together. Um, and this is something that we can um, do some grassroots uh, work on in the community as well. Um, because, like I said, I don't know if we're going to do don't know what's going to happen. If we spend it in $1,000 amounts, that might be good for a few individuals. But then the $1,000 is gone and we're just at no um, So I, I know this county sometimes has an ambivalent or an antagonistic perspective on how the arts can um, uh, be a benefit to uh, Siskiyou as a whole, particularly if it falls outside of tourism or some kind of like sales, you know, perspective. Right. Um, this grant is the antidote to that. This grant is saying we know that artists are necessary for healthy communities. We know that um, if you are vital parts of the community and we are paying you to stay here and live here and be able to. Profit and be vibrant. So that's my perspective on this grant. That's what I would like the community to start thinking about. It's just my perspective, but I think from what I know about Siskiyou and what I know about the state of California, this is the route that um, I see as, as most beneficial for the county. I love that, Patricia. And I, I, I'm hoping that you will get a, you'll have more of this kind of session. Do you know what I mean? And to, because in a way, it's a really ambitious thing. I mean, I know some grants that are offered by California Arts Council, they have they're, they're the larger amounts of money, but they also, the larger the amount of money, they also offer planning grants to yeah. give you time to plan for the big ask, which will come next year. This mm. one doesn't. And that's why we wanted to do the listening tour, because we know we're not going to give you much time to plan. This is us saying, get planning, start collaborating now. So Patricia will gather you all together with others perhaps, or you know, you let her know when you're when you're ready to speak and, and start taking it cheaper. I'm with you on the beauty piece. I think it also ties in with the idea of the dignity of the artist. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And I, uh, they're somehow related and make that part of your case for support. Make it like, yes, we will focus on these issues that the state feels are important for us as a whole. Mm -hmm. But let them be things that we do. Let this project be a thing that we do. When the WPA was paying artists, mm -hmm. individual artists, um, after, the, after a certain number of years, what happened was that community spaces where art was created started organically forming. Yes. And, so, and, and it's just, mm -hmm. I love that. It, it, it just brings, you know, make, it, bring, it gives me a lump in my throat mm -hmm. when I think about that. Things naturally occur. So, and, and more people then have access to creating beauty. And Eliza, if you speak a little bit to not only the reaction about art and energy and like, about the what are your looking for? What make your own looking places of that? Yes, in Mendocino, we have this, we have this, a uh, wonderful conversation with the Mendocino community um, at the Willits uh, Center for the Arts. Absolutely wonderful. And there was sort of an incredible sense of righteous indignation about the Healthy Places Index. Right. <laughs> That's not what Mendocino looks like. We're going to create our own Healthy Places Index. It's going to be a beautiful tapestry or it's going to be a fabulous yeah. mural. And we'll tell you what health looks like. You know nothing about that back to the land movement or whatever it is that we know about it and to see that. So again, I say to you, like, think about what this means for you and then challenge us, but keep those critical issues somewhere in your heart as you as you develop your project. Did you write this grant for this uh, Northern California? Um, we, Nevada County Arts Council wrote the application for the funding that we can then distribute for our state in California. Oh, thank you. And then you will yes. do all the administration yes. for so that will fall at the local nonprofit. We were at. Say, say that to right. you. The Nevada Arts Council is responsible for the administration and all yes. the requirements to go to the state. Yes. NIG. Having said that, so no, it's just no, it's L -L Having said that, um, yes, we are responsible. The, the, the buck stops with us. Mm -hmm. However, we have chosen as our model of administration to work with our peer agencies in 19 counties. So when you submit a grant application from Siskiyou, 
Patricia and I will be working, well, Patricia will be working with you on a peer review panel from your own county. Um, if it's a regional application, we'll draw in folks from that other region as well. So Nevada County Arts Council will sit on every panel, but the majority of folks will be, so it will be you, you know your community best. We will take it, we will be under advice from you. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. And likewise, Siskiyou and all our other county arts agencies will be helping us create the guidelines as well, based upon the listening and the hearing that we, we've done. Our projects in the blue area are going to be prioritized over the green area. They will. They will. Yeah. They will. And again, one of the reasons I showed you the pale green areas is that you can make a case for support. If something's pale green, that means there's something going on there. And you might know what it is, we might not. And I, I'm kind of looking at Jason, who's been so kind and helpful in helping us think about, um, you know, where we could gather tonight, for example. So he knows now that there's a, uh, you know, there's a, a, a part of the downtown Guarica, which is pale green. There's something preventing it from being dark green. What is that? Kind of project complement. So, well, and sometimes also it's building on something that already exists in a place to make it stronger so that it can be taken somewhere else too. So, making the case of really like, hey, it's easier to hone this in here, but we have this to support us. And then it can just be totally given to others. Yeah. I think it's a, just real quick, um, if you all have the information in the will application, you said that we're rolling out in February, March. Is it, is it a one, is that just like an initial application? Will it be a rolling application basis based on with like different criteria? Or is it just going to happen in those first two months? You're completely terrifying me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Patricia and I are going to work on that. Okay, we just have this question. It's a good question. We need to discuss all of this. So, our listening, we're visiting five counties. Today it's Siskiyou, tomorrow it's Del Norte, the next day it's Humboldt, and the next day it's Shasta, and the next day it's Trinity. I know. And so, and so this is our 11th county, I think. Siski is our 11th county. So we're, we're over halfway through. And within about 10 days, we'll have completed, for the most part, our listening talk. And then Patricia and I and all the other county arts councils will put our heads together and think, oh, my God, you know, what are we going to do with this amazing information we've received from you? And how will this affect how we plan the grant cycles? We're not quite there yet, but it's a really great question. We need to remember this one. We do have a, a question here too from from our Zoom participant, uh, Laura. And is arts education something that would be considered for funding? Is her question. I'm kind of looking sideways at Patricia. So within usually with California Arts Council grants um, that are not. So, no, let me backtrack a little. California Arts Council has a small but significant portfolio of arts education grants yes. for, for education that happens in the classroom that is bound to curriculum and for um, you know, academic standards and taught by um, folks that are trained to teach. And then it also has um, programs that, um, that, take, that take place out of school. Um, they're called there's artists in schools program, there's an arts integrated training program for professional development for artists who want to teach. There is um, exposure, there is there are so many different education grant programs. So I do recommend to the um, Zoom participant, is it Laura? Did you say? Yeah. Yeah. So um, Laura, have a look on California Arts Council's grant page specifically for education. No, also that an amazing um, proposition has just passed, which will give, um, it's a, is it 28? It's a, which, um, I guess, it is, it? is it? I think so. Anyway. Anyway, um, it's the only one on there. Exactly. Oh, yeah. A billion for arts. Yes, I mean, it's in education. unbelievable ballot measure that has passed. I mean, proposition that has passed. It's absolutely incredible. So now Siskiyou needs to, gather itself and be, so you artists need to be talking with your school districts, with your schools and preparing them to receive that money and coming up with ideas. So there's a lot going on in arts education 
outside this grant. Having said that, it's a question for us to ask. So usually what California Arts Council says with its grant program that are not specific to education, it says not more than a certain percentage can be spent on education. It hasn't said that in the guidelines so far. I have not seen that. And I know that intergenerational learning is absolutely key to this project. So what does, how do we translate that into the guidelines that we give to you? This is a question for, for us to ruminate and for us to ask California Arts Council. And I, I think I wanna, the comment that I wanna give is um, with this grant, I, I want everybody to think a little higher. So this isn't about one-off in, in my perspective. It's not about one-off projects. This is about, and this word is in the grant um, guidelines and we haven't mentioned it tonight, but I am gonna mention it. It's about infrastructure, okay? This is about systems level work. So one of the recommendations that I would make to people if you're thinking about um, uh, applying for a grant through this program is look at the specific HPI scores and the aggregate numbers that go into that total score. Um, look at the areas and then pick an area and work backwards. So don't try and come up with a project that you think is fun. Look at um, the specific uh, area like housing. Okay, how can I demonstrably improve the housing accessibility for people in this community? That's the way I want you to think about it. And I know Eliza's laughing because I have this big eye in the sky idea about what we could do. And I know that this program it doesn't have enough money for it. I don't care. But how cool, <laughs> how cool would it be? In, in one of these communities where there's a severe lack of housing, we had an artist live workspace because we do not have artists live workspace and the live workspace was also a board of trust. Um, that is something that we demonstrably need. We demonstrably improve um, access to housing and it would ensure that artists were always integrated into the fabric of the community. We probably can't buy a house housing complex with this money, but what we can do is get that idea. And so it's about infrastructure. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So could this grant to be um, put towards, like, say, the purchase of an art center in you know, our building? You know. California Arts Council. I mean, obviously, there's a degree of separation between us as administering organization for those funds and and uh, and you, but. What California Arts Council can't fund is um, the purchase of um, the purchase of buildings, capital projects, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be a that would be a whole thing. But again, creating a foundational um, a foundational project that attracts that kind of attention that can be leveraged to for you know that that could be really something. Another example is like related to climate um, change and emergency preparedness is having a network of um, arts artists as um, community I forget the term uh, community volunteers uh, go at volunteers after in a disaster. Somebody here knows the it's just paying artists to have emergency preparedness training and team I mean, it's literally that simple. So think higher, think systems network. That came up quite a bit in Lake County too. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll, I'll hold it for a while and then <laughs> yeah, I know there's a lot, there's a lot to mull over, isn't there? There's a lot to mull over. What at what I was going to say, and I don't know, I know that Jason's been talking about getting uh living spaces above this, the uh, stores on Minor Street. And I think there is some kind of rehab grant. So we could work maybe with the with the uh, purchase or the rehab of these buildings, but then maybe work together and collaborate with this kind of grant team. Yeah. So the grant could be, let's draw the attention point. to the fact that we have these vacant hotels, vacant second story apartments. Right. Let's activate these spaces with arts or something right. else, and then use that to snowball into a much larger campaign. So yeah, so it may not pay specifically for the capital purchase, but we can definitely create awareness and action um, on those specific things. Love it. Love it. 
How are you feeling? Are you feeling, um, oh my God, this is just so much that's being asked of us? Or are you thinking, this is so delicious, I can get some money and do something? Better all, first. All yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Somebody possibly take a bath and they can see it come down at the same time. I agree with you. I think that needs to be something to not only be done, give the awareness, but it has to draw, grow, draw attention and become self sustaining and actually expansive. And that's where the problem comes. So we're trying to be rough and that's what we're doing now. It seems like a very complicated formula. I'm, I'm having a hard time getting my, <laughs> my mind right. I like the idea of working with faculties. I mean, that gives a process that you could do it. Otherwise, I normally always think of projects and then trying to fit them into that tube that Ida was trying to talk that's I know what unappetizing. You mean. I, know, <laughs> I know what you mean. I mean, so if you kind of simplify things, I often think. If, if you think of un, unhealthy communities, and it also feels kind of insulting to say that, even to use that expression, but you know what I'm saying, according to this, unhealthy communities, often it's where people are very isolated. Isolation seems to play a part. We know, we've already acknowledged this evening, that artists are so good at bringing communities together. And when that happens and things start to happen, it, it draws attention to something that's vibrant that the community no longer wants to do without does that make sense mm -hmm. so you're yes. creating a situation that's that's developing pride of place in remote corners or or, or, or sort of vulnerable corners of sisby that sisby will never be one never want to be out at the end of the grant activity period which is in late september 2024 <laughs> So uh, think about that, like think about how, how your project, people won't want it to go away because it's just so beautiful and it's bringing people together and it's helping with their sense of isolation. Think of it like that. There's, there's not an awareness I find of who the major artists in this UK are. Um, starting with Black Bart, a poet who came from Sheffield, by the way, he's an Englishman. Uh, and and you've got a are you, are you probably know Rush Thurgood. He's an he's amazing filmmaker. He's I from yeah. he's from Forks of Sam. Yeah. He writes music. He makes films. He scores his own films. He's an expert kayaker. And the damn thing is, he's good at all these things. And he's from Forks of Sam. He lives in what's his name? White Sam in Washington. That's where he is now. Uh, Rush Sturges. His family have owned like the Otter Creek Lodge for years. And people go in there and learn how to go uh, rapid water and time. But he does all these other things. There is in Fort Jones, and they're not here, there's quite an active uh, music community there. And they all seem to hide as soon as you look at them. But they all, <laughs> but, but they're there, you know. Also, um, are you familiar with Cornerstone Theater in Los Angeles? Okay, they've had their right. eyes on Siskiyou County for years. They want to come up here and do something. They go, it used to be they go to anywhere in the country. And they would spend a year in a community. They had all these uh, techniques for having the community tell themselves about, you know, don't say, tell me about your community. That's a good way to get silence. So they had all these games and things like that. So they could learn a community. They would hire professional actors and professional writers to write a play about that community, which involved, it didn't involve uh, people going above their level. They did something down in Kern County, which was the most difficult. You know, theater programs I'd ever seen. Uh, and practically everybody in the town of, uh, was it Lost Creek? When it was yeah, in Lost this thing, Hill. Lost, Lost Hill was in it and it was brilliant. And it I was can tell you about it that day. So I brought them up to Kern County to teach our people to work with my little kids. Uh, in, you know, in, in, so but so from, through that contact, I know that Paula from, from um, Cornerstone Theater, they've been wanting to come up here for a long time. They've been looking at Happy Camp, just it's never quite, Gel for them. So there are among the 13 agencies statewide who've been made responsible for administering monies, four of them are responsible for administering pockets of funds for statewide projects. Mm -hmm. So if you don't count, we, we should share the link with Trisha, you can share the link too. And by the way, has everyone given us their email address this evening? 
I seriously, we must be able to keep in touch with you. It's so important. Um, but there are, um, yes, there are, there are four agencies who are responsible for administering state grant. I mean, maybe, maybe that's an option as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, I love the fact that you drew in the literary, digital, media, film, mm. performing arts. Yes. Um, this is a multifaceted project, um, just like the WPA recognized that art could be put to use in different ways. Some of the most amazing guides of America and the different states came out of the WPA, yeah. and they were very alternative, like they were definitely counterculture guides. Yes. I bought a whole load of books about the WPA the other day because I didn't, I realized I knew not enough about yeah. it. And when two of them arrived and they had the name David Kippen on the introduction, David Kippen was the former chair of literature and theater at the National Endowment for the Arts, the NEA. And so I called him up and invited him to have a whole conversation with upstate literary artists that you can all, you know, for, for those of you interested in perhaps, um, you know, participating as a literary artist and being funded for it, then that will be an option. I'm also thinking of other amazing people that would give us inspiration for projects. Um, and we do this, we have a sort of online conversation about it. Yeah. I just want to give thanks that you all are have this approach into understanding and working through this fund, which is a community space for input. Um, I think that there's definitely credit and respect that uh, can be given to those who have been doing this work or who have big names or who have you know lots of experience in that world. But I think what excites me the most about this funding is that it is a much more there's potential for it to be a grassroots approach. And I think for myself as an artist and a community organizer, it's important for everyone, no matter what their experience is or their history, that they recognize themselves as artists that they recognize their potential to be change makers in their community. And so seeing this as an opportunity for it to be grassroots, right, from the ground up, or having it, what I like to say, for us, by us, mm -hmm. right? Um, so really shaping the sort of you know, norms that are often seen in artistic spaces or art spaces where there are those who are qualified and those who are not qualified, or those who are the teachers and those who are or the students, right? Kind of really flipping that and seeing it as an opportunity to empower everyone to recognize their, their abilities and their contributions. I love that. Yeah. Really awesome. Thank you. I also want to note, Siskiy County, I don't know if anyone knows this, I think you mentioned it. Siskiy County is listed as a threatened community because we lose population every year. Um, so what I want to also note is that um, there's um, big names and a lot of um, people have been doing work in the county for a long time. I want to intentionally make space that new people can come in and reside here. Again, we have the back where would they live? Um, Connie that basically had to almost let me live in her backyard. Um, <laughs> even I have difficulty finding housing. I know other people are having difficulty finding housing. So I want to make sure that we're also, when we're looking at this, we're thinking like, Okay, who is continuing that thing? Who isn't here? Um, young people are living here because there's no jobs, there's no professional jobs. Um, if you were born in the state, 90% chance you will leave the state when you become a leader for you have done a job because nobody wants to work in the same state of That's not a job that a lot of people aspire to. Um, but those are the jobs that a lot of areas have to offer. So again, this grant is our opportunity to, to take a big zoom out picture of our community and say, what is not functioning here? What's not firing on all cylinders? Let's fix that um, because we're going to lose more population and then things will really spiral out of control. Patricia, have you looked into the $40,000 up to $40,000 grant that California is giving so that people can make granny flats in their property and things like that? Um, I have not, you know me, I am willing to write any grant oh, yeah. for anyone who comes to me. I literally just beg very senior child to not to, it's about to, housing. to, to yeah. please let me write grants for them and I've gotten turned out. So yeah. I will if you see a grant that you're like, hey, let's write this, call me. Yeah. 
I'm going to call. Oh, go, oh James, that's that literally is, just about. Granny, they're called the Best Welcome Unit. Thank you. And yeah. so, Thank you. the state has alleviated the stress and basically changed the law. So, as the county says their housing element and general plan, they're going to have pre engineered or engineered design plans mm -hmm. that the city will also adopt. And if you want to build an ADU, you don't even need to pay an engineer. You take those plans, you get a licensed contractor, and then you will connect sewer and water for free that you know charge. So we have a lot of action happening in the housing mm -hmm. right now. But uh, Patricia, don't worry about it. That may, that would be the county on the on the city. So the city will not have that situation. So if you want to have in the city limits, you can do it in the ADU at the top, which essentially would be my cost. So we'll do that. Well, that's fabulous. Good. That's great. Tim, do you um looking at our weed? Um, city manager, so, do you have thoughts on this too? The housing piece. Um, well, yes, of course, with uh, our current situation with the fire, it, it's obviously come into a uh, much needed uh, dilemma that we've had with current one. We had a lot of the folks that are displaced because there are no um, rentals available, and the majority of the folks that were in those fires were renters. And the, the sad part is, out of about 60 homes that were burned down, we only have a commitment to about 10 or 12 to rebuild. So I'm working diligently with uh, some developers on the Reading area and even all the down to Sacramento and the city as well, to try to find uh, some folks that want to come in and help us rebuild that area. But yeah, right now, the housing is, we have, I believe, 15 families right now living in uh, RVs. In our but in the wintertime, that's not a fun thing to be doing. So, yeah, it's, it's, but the, the dwelling, like what uh, uh, Jason said, you know, let's go. I, I've done that personally myself too. We were trying to do the lunch last week, and we did the dwelling in there on that one as well. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's well worth it because you know, I took through all the red tape, but I'm more and more. Uh, we call it very flat. That's, like the, yeah. <laughs> That's so, a very English yeah. English expression. Yes. 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 So, yes. So, oh, so, yes. so relating that back to the arts just for a moment, in Nevada County, in the east, in the high Sierra part of Nevada County, it's up at six, seven thousand feet. Um uh the transcontinental railroad runs through it, trucking. And uh Folks up there, the town got uh, the town of uh, got connected to an amazing developer who unfortunately passed away at the age of 35, but not before helping them mirror an amazing project in the bridge in Sacramento called the R Street Warehouse Artist Lots. And um, Ali was absolutely extraordinary. He helped create. Um, a mixed use affordable living transit oriented space um, for folks and for artists. And um, it hasn't necessarily been an easy project. There are lots of issues around it, partly the um, how to sort of help it immerse and become one with the community in which it resides. But it's the most amazing project and sort of very, very progressive, bearing in mind it's a very rural community. So there are so much, there's so much to um, consider. The, the um, developers simply wouldn't have touched it if they didn't believe that artists could become the heartbeat of a brand new community. So um, I, we, we're constantly thinking, who can we bring in to work with our cities to help our cities gauge the potential for such projects? But going back to this grant, um, you know, again, wrestling with isolation within communities, creating beauty, creating spaces for art to happen. Um, these are, are worthy and noble endeavors. Yeah, sorry, Katrina. I just I have my river scientist hat on. I just want to flag for all of you 
Again, thinking about partnerships, if you know of anyone who is really interested in working with some of the topics that might come up around, I'll, I'll call it hauling back the salmon as they come back up the Klamath watershed. It's been an ongoing project with the dam removal, but there are people all over that would love to document and play a role. So just thinking about also ways you can bring in much more uh, larger support from other communities because it's, it's the largest dam removal that has happened in the state. So, so great. <laughs> so great. So great. There's a lot of things to think about. Yeah, so sorry if I if there's anyone that I, I would one I was thinking that we don't have um um Native American, the, the historic Native American population represented here. There's a huge story behind that uh, yeah. of how important this watershed was for their um their entire life cycle, their way of living, their spirituality, there's something huge for them here. Yeah. So it could also there's a lot of angles that can come from the move away from maybe some of the contention and some of the things that we done. I think there's just an older group of people that are very strong beings. And that's about everything here. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a pervasive, so I'm not from this piece, so I'll say it. There's a, a pervasive attitude of um, let's keep it the way it is, because the way is keeps the power structures that are in place in place mm -hmm. who are empowering land. So I don't think anyone in this room is against change. In fact, they're the most likely people in the community who are going to push for um, positive change, but I think they are intimating that they know the forces that they are up against. And if it were as easy as simply saying, I want it differently, so let's just make it happen, it would be done. Um, system would be the way that it could be. Um, system is the way it is because people are working together. I think that's kind of with the dam removal, there's a lot of people are for it. There are some powerful forces in and outside of the working the dam removal. So that's where the tension is going from. Because a lot of people want to help. And again, I'm not going to go into the content of the for yes, I'm going as bringing in. There are a lot of people that are really. There's so many angles to approach what is happening to people in here. So there's I mean, all kinds of pieces and artistic pieces and all kinds of things. So whatever it is, I'm just speaking to you as this river scientist that you're in one of the most exciting areas. Um, so climate Oh my gosh, all that different. Uh, can you speak up so that we can capture you? Sorry, I'm having to use my. But I'm just worried that those on Zoom can't hear, nor are we able to capture them. So, Michael, when it comes to you, I need you to use your big ones. But um, so, uh, Brian should speak to that really about the biodiversity in the Klamath area, where the Klamath not it's the most. Yes, I mean, it's a blend from like you know, the Pacific Northwest to the California desert, it's right at that border, and then from the coastal to the, the high desert. And that there's more plants per acre, you know, in the Siskiyou uh, forest and the Klamath mountains than anywhere else in North America. And that really, you know, isn't really known or out. You are here by challenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is one of the most ecologically diverse um, areas in the United States. Yeah. That we don't have it. Oh, that's a story. That's okay. a whole documentary. That's a beautiful story, weaving in so many voices, mm -hmm. so many diverse voices in the story of your diversity. Mm -hmm. of diversity. Uh, yes, people. It's also. Uh, which I've only been with them in the past few years. And one thing that I, one thing that kind of amazes me is you can always see the catch 22 of the area where there's a housing shortage. Yeah. People can't come here and go to work because they can't get a house. So this is coming up. People aren't going to come here and start growing if you have small businesses that can't get the staff because there's no housing for the staff to live in. You can't ask them to commit. But I don't know what the solution is there, but then, and I don't know how this work is to be persist. Patricia, could you host, put the Arts Council here, host a discussion, just a brainstorm, just on this one issue alone, housing. It might be really interesting, and then 
grab some people from different departments, maybe Jason can help. Yeah, so I'm Tim. And my secret yeah. plan is actually to convince you to go to Happy Camp with us. And that we <laughs> ask Alan mm -hmm. and the Climate Society Art Center to host one of their dinner um, band nights because the entire community turns out for that. Yeah. And then you can kind of get a sense for how close and tight yet that community is. And I think Happy Camp. Generally, um, they are very resilient and used to doing things on their own because they are so far out. Um, and I would love to host a, a housing specific event in Happy Camp because that is one of the most. Um, I know people who work for the group tribe that cannot move to Happy Camp because there's no work for them to work. Um, and that's a consistent thread through um, almost every conversation I have with people. Is, uh, I can't, I either can't get professional work or I can't get housing to do the professional job that I have. Not that all work is professional, but. And just to clarify for folks, if you're in Wairica, I mean, housing obviously is particularly in the VA storyline, but it is a major focus for us. And so we currently have a consultant looking at all vacant property, looking at all city owned property, looking at all dilapidated commercial space. And there is a funding mechanism at the state, billions and billions of dollars. They are going to subsidize the development of housing. And we plan on going after that. They will subsidize up to 100% of the cost. So it is a huge priority for the state and the city of Puerto Rico is taking it very seriously. And we are going to have to have funding, but it may be more applicable in this conversation on housing city county as a whole. Because I can't tell you what it would be. I just also wanted to highlight that um, the Sacramento River, uh, the upper Sacramento River, which turned into the plow, Sacramento River, uh, song versus uh, Chinook. Uh, winter on down the um, same thing as the plow uh, this year. Uh, so that was a really big event. Um, we led by the one we went to. Um, we're not by the recognized that, um, but we're very much proud of the community. Um, and so that's another like you know, bottom of the sort of impact that will that is a highlight and very exciting for our region um, that winter which I very hard around us. Um, and then I also just want to say, like, you know, because of our poverty rate, it, it leaves us really vulnerable to the extraction economy, which is getting a lot of of water in our region. Um, so, in ways that we can generate an economy that is not fully uh, dependent on extraction, um, is, is something that I intend to do. I'll look forward to the future. Well, what about Monday the 19th of December is pretty much the only date that I have. So how about we all meet again on, on Monday the 19th of um, December. Gianna will come with me. <laughs> I will come with me. She'll email. We'll have to get a party bus to get everybody up. <laughs> but yeah, I also want to call out um, the lack of federal recognition for a lot of the people. Don't go away because we can take a picture. Really fast. Hold on, let's quickly grab the picture. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, you're on the clock. But anyway, so for example, okay, with the winter, there's federal recognition called to lay down, not federal recognition. Shasta does not have federal recognition. Modoc do, but they are headquartered up in Oregon. They are no longer physically. Um, of anywhere no basis this year. Some of them are even in Oklahoma. So like the history of what's happened with in this area of all the North State is really important in figuring out why people are here too. And then how we can we got for a lot more to do to build relationships, but also to call out that lack of recognition is um, really devastating. Yeah.